bring together different perspectives on the kind of financing requirements that are there when we think about energy for health and what might be some of the sources of financing available. So there are sources that have been unlocked, whether government or uh, private philanthropies or domestic CSRs. Uh, but what are the mechanisms by which we plan for it when we think about capital expenditure, when we think about operational expenditure, and, we think, and when we think about all of the soft costs involved in really bringing together people and training and uh, their skill sets and uh, community awareness to actually be able to turn these solutions into improving health outcomes. So for this, I'd like to welcome on stage uh, our moderator for the session, uh, Mr. Thomas Pulinkow, Director uh, of Selco India. He has more than 30 years of experience in the sector of clean energy access, sustainable development, and energy poverty. Um, I'm saying all of this before he comes to stage and stops me from saying more. Um, he now serves as the director at Selco Solar Private Limited, which is one of the first social enterprises uh, looking at decentralized solar energy. <laughs> Uh, uh, we also have on stage, uh, we, we also have joining us as a speaker, Mr. Shri Krishna Sridhar Murthy, who is the co-founder and CEO of Sattva. Um, he has been involved in designing and scaling a large number of social impact initiatives. And as the director of, uh, sorry, as the CEO of Sattva, he directs the organization's growth and impact, uh, spearheading collective initiatives in water, education, and livelihood. Welcome, sir. Uh, from the Northeast itself, we'd like to invite Ms. Uh, Lina Margaret on stage to join us on this panel. She specializes in livelihoods and social entrepreneurship. She's the executive director of Masumi Socioeconomic Foundation. Um, the organization works in Meghalaya's underserved regions on livelihoods and on healthcare, and they've been a strong partner of ours and many other organizations here uh, looking at community mobilization and work on the ground. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. VK Jobi, who serves as the CFO of Selco Foundation. Uh, we wanted him here to also share a little bit about the background around, you know, how we program design for the Energy for Health initiative itself. Uh, Mr. Jobi comes with over 30 years of experience in the development space and has been a quintessential part of really bringing Selco Foundation's efforts around financing, planning, program analytics uh, to the fore, and also supporting the Selco Fund and uh, Selco's Atal Incubation Center initiative. Finally, I'd like to request on stage uh, Dr. Meena Serup, who is the Senior Specialist Public Health uh, State Nodal Officer for Maternal and Child Health, and she's in, she was in charge of COVID-19 testing. She was also the Deputy Chief Registrar for Birth and Death Registration for the Government of Manipur. We heard from Ma'am uh, yesterday a little bit on her experiences on the ground looking at maternal and child care. And we wanted to bring her perspective in to understand a bit more about the government perspective on looking at financing and access to resources. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you, thank you, Zuri. So, I think over the last one and a half days, we've been hearing about this different aspects of what goes into you know, making a health for energy for health program possible, what, what are the different aspects of it. But I think one of the most important things is that ultimately all this is dependent on is the financial resources. Unless the financial resources are in place, a lot of this will just remain wishful thinking and it will never get implemented, nor will the services be taken down into the where the poor and the underserved can access it. And I think the need for the financial resources is most strongly felt in areas in the Northeast where it's even more accessible to and difficult to access. Them. So 
It's with this that this panel has been formed, so that we can hear different perspectives of, of, about uh, raising resources. And I have uh, with me Krishna, who is whose organization facilitates philanthropic capital, Margaret, who is a ground level partner as far as you know, delivery of services is concerned, uh, Joby from Sarko Foundation, who facilitates sustainable development and the larger program that we are all part of today, and uh, Meena Devi, who is who represents the country. So we got four different perspectives from four, you know, four different sectors so that we can understand how do we get the money that is required for this particular initiative. Now before I start the, you know, handing over and asking questions to the panelists, uh, you know, this morning I was just going through saying, okay, if I have to talk about leveraging financial resources, what is the current state? And I was a little shocked, and I think I think I'll shock you all as well. Now, India's public health expenditure is roughly one to one point five percent of our GDP, and the health ministry is planning to boost this to two point five percent of the GDP by twenty twenty five. The globe, the global average is around six percent. Now, of the allocation of funding towards health and wellness centers is just 3% of the NHL budget. We heard Venkat yesterday mention that, you know, this roughly works out to around 200 rupees per person per annum and we know how trivial that amount is. Approximately 50% of health expenditure in the country is out of pocket, which basically means even whatever little is being spent is not sufficient and a lot of the poor and the underserved are forced to bring in money from their own resources. And when we heard Dr. Venkat yesterday say that how people shy back from you know accessing health services, even if it is free, because of the fact that you know there are other costs like travel costs, the loss of loss of wages and other things that also impact access to health care. And this is without that. So 50% of the health expenditure without taking into account you know issues like travel costs and out-of-pocket uh, expenses, loss of wages are you know met by the poor. And obviously, the reluctance to be able to access or you know go only when it is absolutely necessary is not surprising. So, in view of this sort of thing, this sort of what I've just mentioned about the priorities of fund allocation for health delivery services, obviously, as far as the government is concerned, is not for infrastructure or asset development or for non-medical operational expenses because a lot of the money is just needed to maintain what is essentially medical. So when we <coughs> talk to health professionals, in fact this morning we were having a discussion and said the moment we talk to governments, we talk to policy makers about why you know energy for health is required and why these you know investments in that side from that for, you know, for those are required, the answer from most of the people is that look we don't have enough of funds to just manage provision of delivery services. Where are we talking about? You know, uh, adding on to infrastructure, powering it with solar energy and things of that sort. And obviously these things have taken the last priority. So with that, I actually go to my you know, fellow panelists, starting with Krishna. My question to you as a facilitator for of philanthropic capital in this country is, can you tell us what was, what does the CSR and domestic philanthropy landscape look like in India today? What is the volume of capital we're talking about? And where is it being invested currently? What is the effort that Satwa is engaging in to mobilize these resources? So if you can start with that, thank you. Thank you, uh, and pleasure to be here. It's always uh, wonderful to see uh, such a, a brilliant set of change makers in one place. So glad to be here. Uh, maybe a bit of a positive shock, you know, to the numbers uh, from that you kind of put out. Uh, the Indian, I, I, I'm sure everybody here knows about the CSR law in India, right? And are you know engaged with CSR in some form. Does if anybody want to shout out what was the last year CSR spent in India? If you're tracking it, what was the size of overall India CSR spent? No? Okay. It was 27,000 though. Right? And growing at a rate of about 10-12 percent, you know, per annum. Right? 
if you look at, so there are four, I'm giving multilateral, bilateral organizations out, government spending out, you know, one's already talked about it. I'm looking at four buckets of philanthropy. The first is CSR, which is growing at a 10 12 percent CAGR, it's already reached 27,000 crores. The second bucket is the global foundations, people like IKEA, the Gates Foundation, and others, who are today in the range of about four to 5,000 crores per annum in India, but declining, and declining reasonably you know, at a rapid pace. Right? As India develops, that's expected to happen. It's, it's not, it shouldn't be alarming that it's happening. It's just the way things will be, you know, as we as we develop more. If we have, if we keep reporting so many billionaires, we can't be going out and asking for more money from the rest of the world. The third bucket is really the uh, the ultra HNI giving in India, and the data that we have, unfortunately, is not very robust. But whatever is available suggests that it's growing again at a at a decent pace and is in the 10 to 15 thousand crore range. But that's only the top 100, 150 philanthropists. India has close to 6,000 ultra HNIs who have, there's no data about what's happening in their giving, right? So we only have an estimate, we can only extrapolate an estimate. And the retail giving in India, which is the middle class giving, already is in the range of 36 to 40,000 crores, but only 10% of that is formal. And the rest of it goes to informal, you know, uh, giving local communities, local temples, kind of stuff, well, religious institutions and stuff. So if you look at cumulatively, the current, you know, philanthropic ecosystem is anywhere between 50 to 60,000 crore in India, which I think is the number that has grown significantly over the last, you know, few years, right? If you, if you told us 10 years ago from someone in the sector that this would be a, you know, uh, the amount of money we would be spending on an annual basis, if you would not have believed it, right? But it's happened, and it's only going to grow from here on. What is the challenge? And we recently put out a report on how much of this money the non-profit ecosystem is able to absorb. Right? And we put out the list of, you know, kind of the top 200 non-profits in the country. We did a lot of research for one, one and a half years about it. And this is what shocked us. Is only about eight to 9,000 crore is what the top non-profits are able to absorb. And by the time you come to the, you know, 200 non-profit, you're below 10 crore. Annual budget, right? Which means if I put all the you know 175,000 non-profits on that one together, with lots of them being small, I am at best looking at 15 to 18,000 crore absorption capacity of the non-profit. So one thing we all have to remember in this space is we have moved in the last five to seven years because as a non-profit ecosystem, we are used to thinking of constraint. Paisa nahi hai, right? We are always thinking that paisa kaha hai, paisa nahi hai. I'm telling you that today we have more money than we are able to absorb. Are we ready for absorption is the question. And the unfortunate answer is not yet. Because only 20 non-profits in the country, including someone here as well, are only about 100 crore in annual budget. Right? Which is too small for a country like this. They don't have the systems, the scalability that's possible. So more and more corporates are now hence getting into self-implementation because they find it easier to do it themselves because the scale that they have to you know, spend. And a lot of the money, and the good news to all the innovators, you know, congratulations on all the technological innovations, the good news to all the innovators is a lot more money is now gonna come to you because the absorption capacity on the nonprofit side is not yet you know, available. So more and more of our customers are now asking to fund research and innovation. More technology startups you know, in this space. So I think that's, in, in some sense, the very positive thing. I'll just say one last thing. Um, Northeast, unfortunately, is not yet receiving, you know, its share of the CSR or philanthropy. But it's, the good news is it's increasing, and a lot more can be done. You can go to our India Data Insights platform where all this data that I'm saying is available. Very interesting for this today's conversation is the top sector in Northeast, which is bringing in CSR, a bulk of period, almost 60% of CSR in Northeast is being spent by, you know, the oil and gas and energy industry. And the most interesting thing is, 40% of the money that they spend goes to healthcare. So you're talking about energy and health. I don't think I have too many people from the CSR ecosystem of this group here 
And that, I think, is a missed opportunity. We need to bring that ecosystem in this room, you know, and I think then we have a very different conversation. You know, Thanks, Krishna. That's pretty exciting. If, you know, there's 50,000, 60,000 crores of money available and only 10,000 of it being absorbed. Then I think, you know, the potential is very large. And that actually takes me to Margaret. Uh, Margaret, as a, you know, social enterprise, as a, as a NGO working in the Northeast, can you give us a little bit of a brief on what is the context that Masoni works in? What are the kind of activities that it undertakes in the broader realm of en enabling better health outcomes? Tell us a little bit more about what you do and you know what are you doing, especially with regards to health. So um, it was really nice to be here. Um, and uh, I really thank for giving me the opportunity to share the uh, stories about the communities where I came from. So um, I'm from an organization called Mosoni Social Economy Foundation. Um, we were based in Meghalaya. Um, also, um, when I started uh, in social development sector in 2015, uh, like eight to seven years back, when I go to the village, while I was climbing up in the hill, I met many people coming down, uh, especially during the uh, rainy season, where the road accessibility is very hard. They bring the sick people in um, bamboo mat stretches to the hospital because there was not a uh, nearby close health center in the area. So while returning back, from the village to my home, I come across with a dead body. So that's the um, ground reality that I come across. And as those type of issues are very common in the area where I was working, and those uh, particular geographical area where I'm operating, my team and our organization is operating, it's not far away from the gateway of Northeast Bohati. So, um, with this type of issue, we organize lots of voluntary um, volunteer uh, doctors from Assam, Guwahati, and also from Meghalaya, and we started a free medical health camp in the area. And during the course of our uh, journey, and when we conduct this kind of initiative in the uh, area, we also um, came across the old aged people saying that they are seeing the doctors for the first time. And this was just 2015. Moving ahead, COVID-19 uh, COVID started. And it was during this time, we also uh, came up with a uh, project under Ajim Tanji Foundation, where we um, give awareness to the communities on the importance of COVID vaccination. Sometimes we cannot uh, even blame the communities that they are not coming forward to take the vaccination because it is uh, our role and responsibilities that we have to create lots of awareness among the people and come forward to take the vaccination. So I'm not blaming to the health department of my state in Mekhalia, but uh, since another new uh, sickness like uh, COVID came in and then the human resource from the health center also is lacking. So that's how they were not able to give the proper information by creating the awareness. And so people are hesitant to take the COVID vaccination. And then uh, at times to some villages, when we come and uh, give awareness, they even chase us with the Tao. So that's the reality. And this was just 2000 and 2021. So um, what I'm trying to say is that um, since Mosoni is also uh, working in uh, these solar energies for quite a, uh, I mean like for some years, about eight years with Circle Foundation. And uh, after the COVID vaccination, uh, during the COVID, like Circle also has started a, a project in Meghalaya where they are um, giving the infrastructure on solar energies to a health center. So after that, we since we are at the ground and we came to know that um, people, I mean like in the health center where the infrastructure are being placed are having lots of issue, uh, started having lots of issue. So um, that's how we started to, uh, we tried to create a model in the uh, health center. So 
it was started with uh, just three months where we uh, closely really uh, i mean we closely monitor the health system and then um, so uh, closely monitor the health system and then um, uh, then now like we are still continuing with another model so in our uh, first three month model of creating an award uh, i mean like the monitoring the health system uh, what what we do our role is uh, we try to make the um, like uh, the government institution, like the health department, and also the community to have a sense of ownership, and also bring the um, message to the community to the last mile that uh, the facilities, these are the facilities, are available at the uh, health center. And apart from that, we also do uh, lots of monitoring the health center. Where what are the issues the community, I mean, the health centers are facing in the health center, and um, so if we get to find any issue uh, at the health center, we, uh, if it, the systems are still under warranty, then we uh, give uh, the information to uh, RAM, IRA, we give uh, information to the CELCO in, um, uh, in uh, health team in Meghalaya, and then uh, they will proceed the issue to the vendors. And then later after that, uh, if the system are still, uh, if the system are no more in warranty, then we are technical person. We got a trained uh, technical person where the issue are being solved. So uh, what I'm trying to bring here is um, lots of awareness creation in the uh, community to the last mile is uh, uh, like is needed, and. Um, uh, so that it can, the message can reach to the last mile, and then the health facilities can be uh, assessed by everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Margaret. I actually wanted to ask you something more, but I keep that pending. Because when you mention things like monitoring of needs, and your monitoring of health centers, and awareness, and other things, I would really want to understand what are your financing needs, but I'll come back to you on that question. So, uh, Joby, we just heard, uh, you know, Krishna talked to us about how large the pie is and we also heard how Margaret feels that, you know, the need for money and the need to, you know, create awareness and things of that sort. So, if my question to you as a facilitator of sustainable development is, what are some of the ways in which Selco Foundation is looking at financial models for the electrification of health facilities? A lot of the, you know, soft costs as well as the hard costs. What sort of models do you think? <laughs> Uh, hello, all. <laughs> Selco Foundation, uh, when we started this program, when the four came, the focus was not just the solar, but at the same time looking at the uh, energy efficient medical equipments, energy efficient uh, appliances, and also building the local capacity for the partners. Partners uh, at the ground level who can take the care of the system as well as also do the monitoring. So, if I speak on the partnership and the models, Selco Foundation have developed uh, three models here. Primarily, one, we do pilots. We do pilots when we put up the whole risk to set up the pilots in the states where we work. The model to which, as everyone said here, we partner with our largest stakeholder, the government. Either it is a central government or the state government. Where normally, the models which we are proposing to some of the states is that we bring the resources up to 30 percentage and we are expecting the states to bring 70 percentage. But there are exceptions in the states in the northeast where we have uh, set a model, for example, a model with the government of Meghalaya. In fact, uh, we piloted first phase 100 health centers, where we bought 60 percent of the resources, and the government of Meghalaya bought uh, 40 percent of the resources. This, in fact, it was a pilot model which we tried. One of the reasons for this pilot is that the whole, the Meghalaya government in fact uh, made a tender, we call it the Swiss model of tender, where in fact uh, what they brought it out that whoever making the partnership 
or those who are ready to invest the 40 percent rates, according to the medical specification, can go with this project. So we drawn up a tender which uh, give more priority to the local suppliers and uh, uh, who can take care of the five years of maintenance. So the cost also the five years maintenance cost to be added to the project. This gave us a clear idea of how much the cost can be and how much the cost can be brought down. And this was a pilot we did to Megalia, which in fact uh, now in a replication scale, which is uh, in, by the end of this uh, financial year, we will be completing around 400 plus in this. By the end of this 2024, the whole state of Megalia will be completing, powering the uh, health centers. Whereas in Manipur, government of Manipur, we worked a few pilots there in uh, Manipur state. And uh, Manipur government proposed that they will bring their resources for around 60 centers. But that did go uh, because of that uh, recent issues there. So what I am trying to do with is here, the major part, the major stakeholder here, what we want it is the government. If it is in the central government, what we had the discussion with, with the Ministry of uh, uh, Health and Family Welfare, that they are ready to put 10% into the cost of the total project, which uh, they have agreed that wherever the state is putting the money, central government will bring the 10% into the project cost. Now the third part of the program, what we designed is that uh, we work as a technical partner. We don't put any resources, but we work as a technical partner. For example, we worked with the multiple foundations who are doing directly, as Mr. C. Krishna said, there are foundations who is coming forward to do the projects, but they require a technical assistance, monitoring assistance, which we are providing to them. We are also providing the same service to the government agencies which wanted to do uh, the implementation, whereas the design and the monitoring part, we do that from our side. And uh, one of the aspects what we learned it is that we also have to give priority to the procurement, to the installation, to the maintenance during this period. Then only the, the cost can be controlled, which in fact leads to your maintenance cost reductions also. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Jovi. What actually interested me in what you just said is the fact that, you know, Meghalaya has been able to take this to the next level by, you know, bringing in resources and, you know, putting in money jointly into that. I don't know if we have somebody from here, from Meghalaya in the audience, from Meghalaya team, but if one of you is there, I would like to hear after this, you know, after we finish the round of questions to the panelists, I would like to hear about how did you make that happen because I think that's really valuable learning as far as the, you know, other governments are concerned. But just having heard that and you know, lis listening to what you said about you know, the, uh, how, how you were developing financial models, my question to you, uh, Minaji, is how can organizations like Sarko Foundation and you know, organizations like Sarko support the government and work with the government because at the end of the day, yesterday we heard from many speakers saying that if this has to reach scale and reach every single you know, health center, then it is only the government that can do. What sort of support, what sort of you know, help do you need from organizations like Selco Foundation or Sarko to make this really happen? Uh, greetings from Manipur. Uh, at the outset, I think I'm very, I'm very thankful uh, to the organization of this, uh, organizers of uh, this uh, two day summit and especially the Selco Foundation who has invited me. And uh, I'm privileged uh, to be here as a panelist uh, today, now at present, I was informed a few minutes uh, back to my <laughs> panelists here. I hope I'll do my best in answering. Uh, yes, uh, actually, Selco Foundation uh, knows uh, best. Uh, their, you know, they have been working with all the uh, Northeast states, I think, and uh, almost all of the Northeast states, no, I think, except Nagaland. Uh, first of all, uh, to set the note, I uh, I, I, you know, I have one sentence which I really like. Uh, you know, in every, it can be applied in many things. How to increase ANC checkup in our OPD, or how to uh, get into loop with the government. This is from uh, health economics. When I was uh, doing public uh, 
पब्लिक हेल्थ यू नो पीजीडी पीएच एम डिप्लोमा इन पब्लिक हेल्थ फाउंडेशन इंडिया आई लव दिस वर्ड यू नो यू नीड टू इंफ्यूज इन द माइंड ऑफ द स्टेक होल्डर्स और द बेनिफिशरीज व्हेन यू गोइंग टू मेक समथिंग सक्सेसफुल दिस इज द परसिव बेनिफिट शुड बी मोर देन द परसिव कॉस्ट and it is very true i think and i tried it out in my centers when i was a mo in charge also uh, like uh, uh, this is uh, like they say that every human being is selfless not in the bad sense like uh, yeah today i am here in this summit because my our uh, uh, you know self officer there in manipur Though I was very busy, they keep coming and telling me, "Madam, you should go. It will be very beneficial to you." And of course, I also thought that you know, solar uh, is eco-friendly. It's very important in our state. Also, has been rolled out, and it has uh, give us dividends. So I thought I should go. And in these two days summit till now, I realized that I gain a lot. This is what the perceived benefit which I have perceived is more than the cost. Rather, I don't have any cost. everything is born by the organizers so uh, this is how uh, we can go about i think any uh, self foundation or the csr uh, firstly they have to uh, communicate with the competent authorities of the state As if it is a health sector now we are, when we are talking about solarization uh, it can be you know various stakeholders can be involved the health sector of course uh, starting from the Uh, you know the health commissioner uh, the director of health mission directors uh, and everybody and the nodal officers concerned and the other departments you can take into loop uh, the the uh, you know the the forest department or the environment and, uh, and climate change uh, you know the, the department various department the phd departments you know and rd rural development and panchayati raj Uh, you know and then minority affairs uh, you know you can uh, take all this uh, stakeholder into loop uh, you know so uh, you can have a, a meeting sort of a thing uh, and then you need to showcase you know what you're going to do while showcasing you know you have to show the benefit the sentence which i said you have to convince uh, you know the stakeholders that you're going to get more benefit Than the cost. So with that idea, you go forward. It should be cost-effective. It should be quality product. You know, it should be sustainable. And what impact it is going to give us, especially in health, good health, which is going to bring about. We talk about solarization. Yes, uh, climate resilient uh, uh, facilities or whatever the equipments. Uh, you have to showcase that. And finally, when it is true that you can. uh going for situational analysis we are going to fo focus uh prioritize the centers for example the health facilities you cannot do a blanket at one go all the facilities we have more than 500 something facilities in manipur one go you cannot go so uh, prioritize the facilities uh, mother and child health care the deliveries are taking place the delivery points you can pick up those type of the icu centers where are where they are uh, there so those type of icu icu especially for ops and gynae certain areas you can choose in a phase wise manner you can do but firstly the government will always say i think in the notice we all know there is gas resource there is financially also we are all, yesterday also i spoke about we are totally dependent on uh, you know the the, the central, central government i think except assam i think almost other states we, we we do not have much resource or revenue so in that case people will love to hear that you are going to do free <laughs> so the initial phase okay you start with a free uh, you know then slowly uh, there should be some achievement in the pilot project good achievement uh, then you know the government will like to go forward yes what so uh, selco foundation have done you know in one 67 facilities it has such and such uh, they say we need to do an analysis not just say this must deliver happen this you know uh, icu uh, you know uh, in coming wrong for example this hospital how many uh, you know uh, people have been uh, same 
you know, whether the institutional delivery has increased, about maternal mortality, uh, infant mortality has decreased or not in those facilities. Uh, good analysis after the pilot project, so into the, you know, the stakeholders. This has happened. Why don't we continue in the remaining facilities? This is how we should uh, go about. And I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, for me, uh, you know, uh, you can call me as an opportunist. Uh, you know, not in the bad sense. Because since we are resource constrained, I always look forward if anybody is coming, you know, free of course, something good they are, you know, explaining to me. So I said, you come. And I'll go forward to it. I'll talk to my, uh, you know, uh, commissioner. So many times, it, uh, I'll uh, quote one example. Mm, uh, it so happened during the COVID days, and very busy, very, very busy. Uh, I was in charge of the testing team. Bara Baje, Ek Baje, you know, we were working everywhere. I do not know how we were working because the testing facilities was this. At that time, I happened to sit, uh, sit down in the stakeholder meeting with one commissioner, uh, uh, this Minister of, uh, you know, uh, Minority Affairs. So, just chatting, no, in between. So he happened, to, he happened to see me that I was very interested in working. So he said, Dr. Mina, there are lots of things you can take from, uh, you know, minority affairs. I said, sir, what are the things I can, you know, propose? And he said, equipment. So you have to send me in one week. But in general, it was a tough task sending you information to all my district to the, you know, watch up group, maternal health, child health, any equipment you which you want, please send it. Then when they send it to me, then I search in the Internet, the specification, because I have to send the specification, I have to write the justifications, uh, uh, you know, the, the ISINF report, data, everything. Finally, I got almost one crore. And one crore is so much for my state. Three of course, I, I got equipment of one crore. So, uh, so these are uh, some, there are many examples which I can say, but uh, I think I will limit to that. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> I just because uh, the questions might be there. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just want to continue with you itself. Uh, you know, you just mentioned about how you have been able to, you know, convince the minority uh, welfare department and how you are also talking about other sources of funding that is available. So, my question to you is, yes, organizations like Sarko Foundation can come and do pilots with you. Organizations like Sarko can help you, you know, raise funds. But what other funds are there? What other schemes are there within local funds that you can tap for initiatives like this so that we can bring about, you know, uh, cleaner energy op options, energy efficient options, equipment that, you know, that is required for the health centers. So what do you think are the other sources of funds that you can tap? Uh, uh, I'm very happy to hear that uh, just now my co-panelists have mentioned about a huge amount of funding is there, but we are not able to tap because we do not know. Just now only I came to know. Similarly, um, I saw this uh, letter from the Ministry, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, which was in 2022 uh, April. That letter was sent to all the, I think, states. You know, 10 person can be proposed for installation of all this uh, uh, solar equipment or whatever, and 90 percent by cell phone. I just saw it. I don't think in my state also they have proposed in the PIP. Because I do not deal with this. Uh, actually, I'm not a concerned person. But then, uh, now after attending the summit, I'm gaining something that I now I can speak to my senior officials that such things are there, we can go for. That is number one. That is from PIP. Because since I'm working for NHM also, I can strongly, uh, you know, convince my uh, my mission director also and my health minister, commissioner also. I guarantee that. And uh, other departments, now uh, one of my team, uh, is, is from Manirwetha, Manipur uh, Energy Renewable uh, Development uh, Department. So uh, she's also there. I was just talking to her. Can some funding be come? Uh, you know, we can pull some fund from from your side. She said, "Why not? We'll have a meeting when we go back." I said, "Then I'll call a meeting. I'll ask the planning and the director, and I'll call a meeting. We'll sit down and do it." So this is one. This thing. Another is. Uh, we have this national program for uh, climate change and human uh, health. So under this also, uh, what I've heard from my uh, DNO, I was just stepping uh, in between. So during their, uh, you know, stakeholder meeting also, there are PhD department, forest department, there's environmental and climate change uh, departments, 
So many programs are there. Why not we pull funding from them? So from different sectors, if you pull in, if Selco Foundation has started and uh, from the ministry also 90% they agree, we are putting 10% for that. The remaining like for maintenance and all those things, training and all of, uh, you know, we can pull in some, some funding from them. But we have to plan properly in your area where duplication should not happen. The ministry will not agree. So this is one uh, area. But uh, there's a huge chunk of money in the development uh, uh, work for, for other days, uh, uh, you know, MLAs uh, or the member of parliaments and all that we have. Uh, but it is difficult to tap. We can try because I have tried for one of my program for uh, this one, Pradhan Mantri Surakshit Matritpa Abhyan. Uh, uh, some of them were active and they have donated. They have donated. On that day, I used to call the, 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 the MLAs and MP sometimes in my program. If I go from the state, then I, uh, to that facility, they also come and give a motivational speech like that. On that day, they used to donate some money. But the 60 of them, uh, uh, it is difficult. Though we have given letters and all, no? So similarly, I think in this area also we can try, but uh, from them I think it will be a little bit difficult. We may try also. Trying there is no harm, so we may get also. So then other than that, uh, Panchayati Raj, RD, Rural Development and Panchayati Raj also we are closely linked. I think uh, from them also, uh, especially for the community, uh, what do you call uh, solarization of their houses and all these things, cities and the Manireda. So we can all uh, link together. But then we have to have a, uh, a big stakeholder meeting, properly planned meeting, uh, a direction from the sort of a chief secretary of the state. Otherwise, it will be difficult. Or the minister, medical minister of the state. So, uh, like, like this, we can uh, go forward. I think uh, I'll try out first. Uh, you may say that I speak a lot and nothing is happening in Manipur. <laughs> I hope the crisis ends. I think I can do lots of work and we have been doing also. You know, Minaji, I think one of the most encouraging things that I've heard today is that you're already starting to speak to you know, Manireda or whether it is the you know, Ministry of Panchayati Raj, you're planning to have a meeting because I believe there's a lot of funds available in the government from different sources that can be tapped for things like whether it is, you know, the climate change money that is available, whether it is money for the renewable energy from the renewable energy department, a lot of it can be tapped and effectively brought in to help delivery. And as you said, a lot of MP funds and MLA funds, ultimately, their funds are meant for their people. So I think, you know, it's very apt that, you know, you think about it. I'm, I'm very, very enthused by that. Anyway, now, if I can just go to you, Margaret, and uh, ask you, you know, you, we've heard from uh, both Salka Foundation as well as Sakla about, you know, what, what are the sources available, what are the models that they do. We also heard from uh, Meenaji about, you know, what are the opportunities for convergence of bringing in more money. I would really like to understand from you, for an organization like Masoni and other actors in the local ecosystem, what are your main financing needs? You did mention something about uh, program design and, you know, quality assurance and things of that sort, but what are the non-hardware components that you want to raise money and how easy is it for you to get that money? It would be good if you can just, you know, briefly tell us about what, what are the cost implications of doing that, how expensive is it for you, how expensive is it for you to access spare parts considering the fact that you work in some of the remotest areas of Mega, I visited some of your areas and, you know, we walked the whole day to reach some of the centers. I really like to hear about what are those cost financing needs that you have. Uh, I will uh, share with my observation and also learning uh, through this uh, monitoring and follow up with the health center. So um, for the first three months when we started our uh, printing and model, we operate the technical person from our office uh, to see uh, the maintenance of for maintenance of the uh, solar uh, system which are being installed at the health center in Meghalaya. So we are catering to um, 49 health, uh, health center in Ripoy district and the uh, distance we covered is um, 
202 kilometers, and the nearest one is uh, 8 kilometers. So um, when we operate from an, or uh, an organization in the head office, like in our office, uh, the amount which we are spending only in travel itself is coming to uh, 7,500 plus. That is only for traveling. Then um, in the next four months, uh, when we started the um, monitoring, we uh, started to realize that we are spending so much in travel costs. So in that, we uh, started to identify the local uh, technical uh, person in the, uh, within the communities. And then um, uh, what we uh, came to know is that um, for travel, it has become uh, like nearer distance from the person we identify from the local to the um, health center. So the cost, the highest cost which we are um, spending uh, on travel has come down. The highest is to um, 2,000 rupees. So that is the difference. Um, and um, that's the maintenance part. And uh, the second thing uh, which I wanted to put up is that um, though there are uh, lots of uh, infrastructure uh, being uh, put up in the health center, there are also um, uh, many people who come and access to that facilities, but there are also uh, communities, uh, the last mile we call it, uh, where the information did not reach. So um, an organization like us and the uh, other organizations who are working at the grassroots level, since we are closely monitored and working with the community, um, like we can give the information. And I just want to cite one example in this. Um, from the um, stay, I mean, like from the health center, um, the health workers are also taking lots of initiative to uh, give the message to the last mile. But uh, at times, um, when they go back, like example, the ashas or the anganbadi, uh, the information will be given to them by the doctors or the nurses in the health center. But when they go back. Uh, to the village, there are uh, some places or in the villages where the information did not reach till the end. So in this uh, kind of uh, things, like um, an organization from the grassroots is very important that I want to highlight. And um, the other one is uh, because of the distance, um, when we identify the uh, local uh, technical person from the local, um, having uh, spare parts, the hard cost, the spare parts and all, it's very important because once, if he did not carry the spare parts with him and he go for assessment, and the same day, or uh, the same thing, the next day he has to travel back. So this uh, monitoring of health system, what we are trying to um, uh, build a model is that um, we doesn't want a single uh, person or in the health center where um, people should suffer because of the lack of energies. And that's how uh, when any issue is being raised in the uh, center, within 72 hours, we try to uh, solve the issue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. I, you know, I would want to ask you something more, but unfortunately, my stomach is reminding me that you know, I need to wind up. So, but I don't want to, you know, let go of this uh, this session without actually speaking, going back to both Jodi and, uh, you know, Krishna on because we heard about the huge amounts of money coming, how do we tackle? So let me actually, you know, let me actually start with uh, Jodi. And uh, Jodi, can you sort of tell us on, you know, expand on some of the funding sources that are available. You heard about the soft costs that uh, an organization like Masoni has. You heard about, you know, the need for piloting. What are the other sources of funding that can be tapped for solar electrification of health facilities and for the operational expenses that Margaret has spoken about? After hearing uh, Sri Krishna, I think this is the easiest thing now. <laughs> you have a large jug of money is available. So if I put uh, uh, the hardware cost for 25,000 centers, it is approximately 1,000 to 1,250 crores. It is approximately 5 lakhs per, per center for a 5 kilowatt system. Now, apart from that, there is an operational cost. Operational cost in, in terms of uh, uh, replacement of the spares, as well as also there is a monitoring cost. 
In fact, we are piloting with Muzoni to see that how much the monitoring cost a terrain like Meghalaya, how, how much that operation, uh, I mean, that monitoring cost comes. So, how do you, how do we collect this cost? I mean, how do we manage this cost? In fact, uh, uh, apart from the PIP and the government uh, funds, which uh, in fact uh, some of the states are able to mobilize uh, up to 60 percentage money uh, through the PIP and other models from the government side itself. But apart from that, there are other uh, areas where we were able to mobilize and uh, that is we have piloted also. One of them it is that uh, uh, is aspirational district fund. Aspirational district fund, if I will give you an example, uh, the remote district we piloted the eight health centers and it was funded by Niti Ayo under the aspirational district fund. So there are uh, PSUs, it is mandated them to spend uh, uh, in the aspirational district. All the funds under the CSR, they have to mandatorily spend under the aspirational district. So this is one of the areas which uh, we work also worked with the, some of the PSUs to power as well as also look into the infrastructure. And some of the other models like uh, uh, in uh, Orissa, what we found, we didn't found in Northeast, uh, like the district mineral fund, which they are using, the state government is using to uh, power around 100 centers, where our role is that we provide a technical design, designs to the government. Apart from this, uh, what we also found an interesting uh, thing in Megali is that they are doing health and wellness centers which is uh, approximately the cost of each center is around 55 lakhs. And they are doing a large number with the support from the World Bank. And it is a long term loan to the government and they are uh, uh, building a center with uh, all the built environment or concerted along with the solar. So this is a large project which is coming in Megalia. For uh, this is, I am speaking about apart from the CSR and the other government support. So there are, within the government itself, there are other areas where we could tap the funds uh, which is required for this. Now, if I comes to the operational cost of it is, there are certain costs which is saved in the center. For example, I was reading an article on the health center which is uh, in the book which is given here. That 2 lakhs rupees is the operational cost for diesel and uh, electricity in a hospital in uh, Nampong, which they will spend every month. So technically it is a savings from their side to use for the operational cost. Yes. So this is apart from as uh, uh, Karina Trust, uh, uh, Mr. Venkat said yesterday, there is around 175,000 this R uh, uh, the RKS gets as an uh, unnamed fund. So there are some funds which is available as well as also funds like this, uh, the savings from the diesel and other things should be able to mobilize and use for the maintenance cost. Now if I put in figures, now approximately the cost of uh, Meghalaya, uh, I mean uh, Mizora, is for the solar powering of 300 plus centers for us it is in, it was around 11 to 12 crores. And, uh, Megalaya for covering including the medical equipment, it is around 40 crores. Which is, and you need to calculate around 30 to 40 percentage as the budget for replacing the battery after 5 years. What, one of the points as I said in the earlier, what we made sure that till 5 years, the vendors itself has to take care of the system. Which makes it that your batteries and other equipments can stay, I mean, the life will be more than that. Now, if I take it as a 30 percent rate, which if you calculate the savings from the diesel as well as electricity versus and, and uh, the RKS or other sub, uh, support from the government side, which should be able to replace the batteries at the end of the five years. So this is the way we calculated uh, the funds. And uh, the cost which uh, uh, market speaking, I think somewhere we need to tap the CSR fund for that either CSR or philanthropy, because it's a responsibility of the CSR as well as for the philanthropy. We cannot put anything to... So, there is an operational cost for monitoring, because if there is a proper monitoring, like uh, as we discussed yesterday, unless you have a trained team there, unless you have a system to monitor all the systems functioning, it will not happen. 
So there is a cost involved and we should definitely look for CSRs or other philanthropies to cover that cost. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jyoti. Uh, you know, I think all that brings me back to the 50, 60,000 crores that Krishna is going to bring all of us over here. So Krishna, now tell me, what are the main opportunities and challenges that is going to be faced for mobilizing resources for initiatives such as the energy for uh, health you know, initiatives? What are the main challenges? What are the main opportunities? What should the governments here, what should the organizations here, the innovators here be doing to access this 50, 60,000 crores? It would be good if you can also tell me how Satwa is going to do this for us. So, I just also want to clarify that I said God is there, but salvation kill you to work hard. <laughs> so, it's there, the money is there, but it's not going to just come in, right? Uh, for example, I, I can tell you, because we do so much of engagement and events in Bombay and Delhi with these ecosystems, we've hardly done a Northeast event in Bombay or Delhi. You know, and I'm sure you all struggle to bring some of those ecosystems today here. They all had something else happening and it was very different. So I think we need to take, I think Sir was talking about the boat example of saying go where the need is. I think we really need to take this ecosystem to places like Bombay, Bangalore and Delhi where the bulk of philanthropy and CSR decision making is happening. Right? While the spend is getting spent across the country, the decision making is happening in these three cities predominantly at Chennai, I would include as well. This ecosystem has to go there. You know, and engage, and that's definitely something that Sadhwa can help. We can we can bring together, you know, a, a good show, you know, there. Uh, the second is, I think the map touched upon a very important point uh, when she said evidence and analysis of impact is important. The domestic funder is different from the international funder, and that's a very important realization that people need to have. And more importantly, especially the CSR is not is very different from you know, someone like an ITR, you know, kind of an organization. Because they want to be more a, a philanthropist or write a check. They're not going to sit with you in the team. But the CSR is not like that. CSR wants to be a player. If some, if you're funding, if they're funding something around their factory, they want to be involved because it impacts them, you know, if that project goes well or not. Right? So a corporate in India is going to be a player. He's going to be a partner. He can bring more than money, you know, into the system. And hence, looking at it as a partnership and not just as a donor, you know, or just as access to capital, I think is the mindset to change while engaging with, you know, some of these ecosystems, which I do believe they can bring a lot more, you know, support uh, uh, to these. And fully agree that, you know, for, for um, the needs that Margaret put out, CSR is a very good option, you know, and, and many of the CSRs will be very open. I think the big advantage we have, we have here in this project, especially in the kind of work this, this ecosystem is looking at, is you're able to tell the story of leverage. We are able to tell the CSR saying, if you give us X, someone else is giving Y, and the government is putting Z. That's a story every CSR likes. Because they know that it's a partnership, you know. So far, uh, if you take the 10 years of CSR, 2 lakh crores cumulatively has come to the sector. 2 lakh crores cumulatively. Last month, GST of India was 2 lakh crores, right? So, 10 years of CSR is one month of GST, which means philanthropy alone is not going to change this, right? And the CSRs are now realizing this. So, hence, this leverage point, you know, is not, it has to be talked about, you know, kind of a lot more. The last thing I will, I will leave it with is, there are many hooks, and we talked about, you know, um, um, that this is, could be a de rural development project, it could be an energy project, it could be a health project, and there will be many people who will come here for different reasons. Right? Someone from Fortis could come here because it's a healthcare thing. Someone from, you know, uh, the Tata Power can come in because it's an energy thing or a style. And someone may come in because it's a rural development thing. Uh, because the BFSI ecosystem loves rural development. So we need to figure out what is the right story and what is the right hook for the donors to kind of come in. And we have not yet, I think, explored enough on the blended finance story here as well, right? Is there economic value getting generated out of all of this stuff? What is the economic impact of doing this, you know, well? Right? If you are able to solve healthcare in a clean energy ecosystem, what is the economic benefit of that to the state, to the community, to the, to the ecosystem? 
If that can be captured, we can unlock a lot more blended finance coming in because many, many organizations, even in CSR, are looking at where they can bring in money that can create multiplier kind of impact. So I think the opportunity is there. God exists, but salvation will be all to work quite hard. Thank you, and I hope Satsa will be the guru in between God and the <laughs> so, so. Okay, I would like to ask you more, but I'm a little worried that, you know, keeping the mic on my stomach will also hear you hear growling in between. So, I am now going to open up the uh, session to people in the audience. If there are specific questions that you would like to ask the panelists, I don't know, I, as I mentioned in between, we have, if the person from the Meghalaya Health Team is here, I would like to hear from you how you've been able to convince the government to put in the money. So we'll start with her, I think she's there, so we'll start with her and hear from her. And then uh, one or two questions because by the time I think my stomach will make the necessary noises. So. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the Thank you again. Um, I mean, as how I had shared yesterday uh, regarding the Michalia journey for the solarization of the health facilities, uh, to me, uh, one thing which we started was like during the COVID, when I have mentioned that uh, that's how we took the initiative of, you know, solarization. So that time, uh, Selco wanted to partner with the uh, government of Meghalaya. And I would like to thank my mission director. He's a great leader and also a visionary. That's how we have started this collaboration of 1640. I mean, uh, for the government to do anything, I think if there's a will, there's a way. I mean, in my experience of being National Health Mission for the last 10 years, if there's a will, there's a way you can do any program which you feel it is a priority, which is important. If you think if you can convince, I think so you can get it. Because it's like, uh, as how Mr. Jody had mentioned, uh, we are close to about uh, 14 crores, as how we have mentioned, for the entire facilities to be solarized. So I think it is not much also. And in the last two years, we have also got approval under the PIP uh, for the, you know, for the remaining health facilities. We have put in, in a plan, and it was not planned, it's actually when we had gone to Delhi for the approval meeting, and I, have, uh, and I, I mean, I'm part of the planning process. So it was easier for me, and whenever the team from the ministry, from NHSRC, also had shared the guidelines that, uh, you know, it is important that our health facilities should be solarized. So they have given uh, us how much is the unit cost for each of the health facilities, if it's a PHC, CHC, and a sub-center. That's how I have planned accordingly, and we have got approvals for the last two years. So it's been very easy and seamless, considering that we have got the approvals. Uh, for the benefit of all my colleagues from the northeastern states, uh, I request you all, now you have the climate change program, there's a budget help for that. You can do at DH, at CHC, and even at uh, PHC and subcenter also. So it's even easier now, because now it's a priority uh, for all the states, you know, to, uh, imp it's important to have all these uh, uh, climate health, resilient health facilities. So uh, that's it, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I think, you know, people from the government would value, would have find great value and find understanding from her because one of the frequent responses that we have got is that it's difficult to put in infrastructure into the IP and it would be really wonderful to understand how they have managed to do it. I understand when she said priorities are important, you need to prioritize on what you're using your funds at, but it would still be a worthwhile learning of interacting with her. Uh, yeah, I think I saw a hand here for the questions. Um, hi everyone, my name is uh, Kachok, so I am from Chupaigo. Uh, so we have been uh, supporting uh, the National Program for Climate Change and Health as an official partner in 13 states including the Northeast. So my question uh, particularly uh, to fund leveraging is, you know, as we have seen during our, uh, whilst, uh, you know, in our work in the 13 states that uh, even though we do have an idea of where, to, where the existing funds are, but at the district level, at the state level, during the implementation uh, part of it, it's very difficult for you know, the nodal officers or to actually like, map and leverage these funds. So how do we as uh, development partners uh, actually support these people at the state and district level to map and leverage these funds? And 
streamline the program implementation. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Kent, I think there was a question up here, and I'm not able to see because of the lights. I don't know how many hands are being raised, but if we can, uh, you know, bring in the questions together and then come back to the panelists. Yeah, uh, thank you. I actually don't have a question as such, but I can. Uh, I'll actually echo a lot of what Shri Krishna has mentioned uh, on on the blended finance bit. Maybe I can come with that after the question is answered, and I hope that's okay. I have a question. Yeah, Thomas, sir, on your left. Sorry, I'm not able to see, but please. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So I'm from uh, Selfo, uh, and my question is for Sai Krishna, perhaps even Margaret. There are a lot of organizations here, are the NGOs, the grassroots NGOs that are there. Is there um, something uh, missing at the NGO level that uh, curtails CSRs from uh, directly funding them? Is there uh, some sort of capacity building specifically that is required that will help CSRs invest in them directly or is it just a discovery problem, they just don't know each other or is there some financial issues also? I'll take one more question and then we'll yeah. go back to the uh, panelists. I saw, I saw a hand here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, sir, this is Naresh from Rangde P2P Financial Services Limited. Primarily, the discussion whatever has happened on, on the uh, edge of uh, grant and how it can be utilized, whether it is the government or the CSR. But uh, one thing I want to really understand is where does the credit come to support these things? Whether it is energy for health or energy for livelihoods, where do this component of credit can actually you know, uh, open up more uh, scope for organizations like this? Sorry, uh, just a quick question. I know you said last, but this is a quick question. This is for the guru between God and the salvation. What percentage of the 50-60k is for health? Because that's also something uh, that's important. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I'll actually go back to uh, Jogi and Krishna. And if you could just answer two questions. One is that, you know, at what is the support that is required that was there from the Selfa Foundation Kali, you said what is the support that is required for NGOs to be able to tap these funds? And also speak about, you know, how can we map and leverage what what in your idea? And I think that should be more from to Jovi and Nina G to sort of say what is that is needed to map and leverage the funds that would be a bit. So uh, I can start off and I think the so just on the health uh, uh, I think close to uh, 20, 23 percent is on health, which is a very, very significant number. Education and health itself is close to 50 percent. So, you know, so there are people in the water sector sitting and saying, hey, healthcare is getting everything, you know, uh, which when, when water is probably the largest problem in India, you know, arguably at this point. But, but anyway, so I think that's one of the uh, good things from a health perspective. Uh, coming back to the question on, I think discoverability is a problem. There's no proper place to discover non-profits with, with good data available, something that, you know, we're working on and, you know, we're, we're looking to build. Uh, but also you need to remember the law today puts the onus on the CFO, you know, of the organization for utilization by March 31st, right? That gives a lot of shivers down the, the hands of the CFO, you know, of an MNC because he has to now make sure it gets given to the organization with the right repute and with the right this thing where you get the utilization certificate. And unfortunately, a lot of the small NGOs are not yet ready for the, the rigor of the expectation of a CFO of a large organization, right? So today there's a lot of capacity building on the staff function, not the line function, the work that the organization actually does, but the ability to engage with these ecosystems, to keep audited statements, to have a good website, to have good communication. I have had lots of NGOs come and say, everybody is asking everything in English, we don't even write things in English. You know, we do all our work in local language, you know, how do I put it up on, you know, on their reports and stuff like that, right? So there's a lot of capacity building. So we built a platform called India Partner Network. If you are a small NGO, please register on that. We will bring a lot more RFPs on that platform. So whatever happens via Sattva, you will see on that platform, India Partner Network. But that's a very important aspect of capacity building, you know, to be kind of uh, taken into. And I think NGOs in general, I think you have a lot more story to do brand building, to do, you know. Uh, a lot of the NGOs today, you know, shy away. They're very happy doing the good work. But you have to go out there and you know market yourself right? and, and 
and be out there in forums. There are many organizing, I mean, many events happening, online stuff. People are also looking for you, you know, everywhere. Please market yourself and communicate more, more actively to the rest of the ecosystem. Thanks, Krishna. Thank you. Uh, I like to. Uh, there's a question which is raised on the credit part. Uh, I don't know. There are many examples, but there are a few examples which uh, it's uh, because, as you know, that the public health it is uh, uh, primarily it is taken care by the government. It is not that, uh, uh, and it is mostly subsidized. But there are models like uh, which I explained earlier. There are financed by long time financed by World Banks and other institutions to build the infrastructure or uh, to support the system. So there are also credit models, but uh, you need a long time investment for, uh, for to sustain that. And the other question which uh, she was raising on the partnership, uh, which uh, normally we go with the, the government uh, uh, departments because uh, the government departments have certain allocations uh, and uh, we do some proposal and negotiation and, uh, and uh, before we start at the district level or other levels, it starts with the state level, state governments, where uh, even if the offices change at the district level, the programs continue from the the government. So, we, because we wanted to bring into the attention of the government that uh, this program is what we are proposing in this. Uh, whenever uh, an NGO or any foundation comes to help us, so the, the first question the government asks is about sustainability also. Apart from what I have said, but sustainability is very important. They will say they will start for one or two years and they will leave it. So, uh, you know, what is the point of, uh, you know, uh, solarization? Uh, like uh, one, uh, this thing, uh, so for one example. So, uh, ultimately, uh, what my co-panelists have said, ultimately the government should take the basic initiative. They should be committed. So, what I found recently, the planning department, the planning department, the, 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 the CSR, and many other, they are, uh, they are coming to them and they are, you know, uh, what are the things they can be done, no? So, so this, uh, mainly in every state, I think it comes to the planning department, the funding, uh, how to leverage uh, funding. No? I think we should, uh, uh, you know, the interdepartmental, uh, when we have a step the meeting, the planning department is very, very important.
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Mankut Poshik. I'm actually from India Climate Collaborative. And I think uh, ICC and Satwa has recently, uh, we, we are part of the India Partner Network as well, where a lot of CSOs are also registered to the ICC's network as well. Something that I just wanted to bring up here is that the kind of solution that we see even within the climate, health and energy uh, aspect. For example, now even recently at the COP, what we saw is that climate and health uh, became a very big topic of discussion and there was a lot of focus not only like, uh, I mean, not only in India but then overall in the, in the international audience as well. So something that, like, given that the kind of solutions that we exist in the ecosystem, we also have to focus on that. For example, the solutions or the challenges in Northeast in terms of climate and health are very different from what it could, might be in the northern part of India or what, what is in the uh, southern part of India. So for CSOs working in this particular ecosystem, it is also important for them to identify the challenges and in order to take them to any particular donor. For example, with the ICC, we deal with CSRs, we deal with HNIs and UHNIs and Philanthropies and Foundation. But, I mean, the message from them or the feedback that we get from them is that we don't want to do the same thing over and over again. Like solarization of PHC is one particular thing which is very catchy, but then is it the same solution over and over again? Uh, that, that some CSRs might not want to do, then look at the other aspects of it. Something that other, uh, like one another aspect is the well-being part of it. For example, uh, indoor air pollution. Uh, at least in the northeast, we see biomass, uh, use of biomass for cooking is a big issue and then there is a lot of indoor air pollution, which is again affecting the health of women mostly. And then there are so many other issues as well, particularly if you go to the tea gardens of Assam, you see anemia is one of the issues and then uh, other like child growth and all, which are already there. So it's also important for CSO, I have a question from, the, uh, from someone from the audience who said that is it a problem of the CSOs not being able to identify the solution? That is also one of the challenges that we also find. The CSOs also so report back. So in terms of like things like when you talk about blended finance, but a CSI is willing to fund a particular project if they find it innovative enough or if they find the government buy-in from that particular project or the particular solution. So what's more important for CSOs and also other stakeholders in this uh, room today is to understand and also identify the local challenges and also work with local you know, communities and um, uh, partners as well. Something that Sanjay Hadarika said already mentioned is that going, taking the services to the uh, community is something very important. It's not, uh, not really like a top-down approach that we do solar PHCs everywhere, so that's what we want to do. Uh, but also looking at the very nuances of the solutions that, that lie within the climate, health and the energy aspect of it. So that's something that I want to bring in. And if there's anyone interested to more, learn more about the ICC's work, I'll be very happy to uh, talk to you. So, yeah. yeah, thank you. And uh, I think I've overshot time significantly in our uh, session. So let me sort of sum up by saying thing. Uh, a couple of things that I learned today as part of this discussion is that there is money available, whether it is with the government, whether it is with CSR, whether it is with you know organizations like the Selfa Foundation that can facilitate the whole thing. There is money available on one side. On the other side, we have NGOs and CSOs like Masoni who or, who don't know how to tap it, who don't know where the opportunities lie. And I think that's where organizations like Selfa, Selfa Foundation, and the ICC can actually come in and you know create these platforms where there's more of policy convergence that is being discussed, more of you know how other funds can be tapped is discussed, how can these NGOs bring in about some amount of leverage into the you know the ecosystem can be discussed. And I think that's something that we should take back today. So on behalf of the Salco Foundation, Salco India and all the people who are here, I thank the panelists. It's been an enlightening session and I think you know it's a nice way to end this uh, this one and a half day event that we've had because I think ultimately we are going back to that, you know, with the feeling that yes, we want to do something, there is money available to do it, now let's get down to it. So thank you all, thank you very much for being part of this function. Uh, can I ask my colleagues to kindly honor the panelists?
what might have about this. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. I think with this, we have come to an end of the formal uh, events that we've had. So, just after, we'll, we will now break for lunch. But before that, I'd hand it back to my colleague Surabhi and ask her to take this forward. Yeah, thank you. Special privileges for <laughs> senior advisors. Um, thank you so much to the panelists and to our moderator. Uh, another round of applause for bringing this last panel discussion session together. Uh, while we do have a workshop uh, for clean energy enterprises and NGOs where we want to uh, discuss a bit more on the nitty gritties of looking at assessment, installation and operations and maintenance within the Northeast region and look at what kind of roles and responsibilities come up and how we might be able to address some of these challenges. Uh, we also have a note in the afternoon um, during this session uh, we have a pre-recorded video message from Mr. Jeevan Kumar Jethani, who is the Senior Director of the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy. Uh, he unfortunately could not make it here, but he's uh, sent a short note. And we welcome all of you to join us for that post-lunch session, which will be from uh, 2.30 to uh, approximately 4 o'clock at the latest. However, we are aware that some of our government colleagues might need to leave earlier. So we do want to take this moment to uh, formally thank uh, our government colleagues, especially from the health department and from the renewable energy development agencies across all of the states of the Northeast uh, that took time to come in here. Um, and you know, Mr. Shri Krishna reflected on how do we take this setup there? We first wanted to make sure we're able to bring different people from within the Northeast into one space so that they have an overview of the kind of ecosystem that is around them and to try and see how they can leverage whether it's the innovations out there, whether it's the networks that a lot of us bring from other states um, and from other cities but also the networks amongst themselves to look at learnings and best practices. So we're hoping that this is a start to bringing these states their specific strategies together and to build these on-ground plans going forward. And we invite all of you to, um, uh, to partner with us, to work with us, to collaborate with the other people that you met within and, and with the innovators outside to take these efforts forward. Uh, with this, I'd like to say a formal thank you uh, again to our government partners, to our NGO partners, uh, the clean energy enterprises, and all our colleagues uh, within the Northeast and outside who brought this together. Uh, thank you so much. Lunch is being served outside. We will come back here for a workshop after. Again, you're most welcome to join us. Uh, this will be a workshop that is more focused on the clean energy enterprises and the NGOs. Thank you.